Coming up on Digital Music Trends 180 on the 23rd of April 2014, Beats Music allows in-app subscriptions, Shazam said to be partnering with Apple for iOS 8, a look at Record Store Day 2014 with UK coordinator Spencer Hickman, Pandora's pre-1972 headache, Samsung Milk going premium, Rock in Rio's Vegas plans, Sony in India and the Beat Robo's fundraise. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And the DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels, including the iTunes Store, most podcasting apps, including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, and many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out on the load and on the latest shows, you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list, or you can get in touch via Twitter on at DigiMusicTrends or email contact at digitalmusictrends.com and uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome two London-based guests uh, starting with Stuart Raj, journalist covering uh, music technology as Music Ally but also apps and technology at large at The Guardian. So hi Stuart and thanks for uh, joining us, how's it going? Good, good, thanks, hello, hello. It's great to have you and uh, it's also a real pleasure to welcome uh, back to the show uh, Stephen O'Reilly, the CMO at Shuffer FM. So hi Stephen and uh, how's it going? Hi Andrea, things are good. Excellent, it's great to have you and uh, hopefully we're going to have a, a guest uh, popping up uh, in a few minutes to chat about uh, one of the stories. Uh, uh, but uh, this week uh, I'd like to open by talking about uh, Beats Music. And so there were a couple of different things uh, that we can discuss around Beats Music this week. Uh, but uh, I'd like to start with sort of the factual side of things, which is always a good start, I think, you know, the, the actual story that ha uh, really happened. And, and, and that is the fact that Beats Music has bitten the Apple bullet and decided to uh, add in-app purchase uh, to it's a uh, uh offering on the iOS app uh, which uh, remains at $9.99 a month in the US so that means that uh, Beats Music is giving uh, essentially 30% of that revenue to Apple uh, the move was apparently uh, the move was apparently spurred by the fact that Beats Music has a heavy iOS user base uh, and uh, you know they had to go out of their way to make sure that the uh, iOS users could upgrade uh, super easily and uh, uh, you know try and capitalize on, on that on that uh, support from from uh, the Apple ecosystem. So Stuart, do you think this is a kind of a weird move considering that uh, uh, most other companies that are working in this field uh, and that have added a, a, you know in-app purchase for their streaming service have actually charged more to consumers? To, to be able to compensate for that loss. Yeah, I think it's a very bold move from, from Beats because I think you know, if you're a streaming music company, you pay 70% of your revenues out to publishers and labels, 30% is your margins for everything else, and they're giving that all up to Apple. So I'll be interested to see if it's an opening gambit and they'll raise the prices later or if they're really intending to be very, very aggressive. and go Because I think audio is, what, $14, $14, $15 in the States? Right. And these over here. So... But yeah, I mean, it's very, for users, it's good, I think. Subscribing, that, that whole moment where you have, right, I can't have it for free anymore, I have to subscribe. Yeah. Can I do it with tapping a button here? It makes sense. I think Spotify is the only company not really doing that now and, and holding out and saying we have to keep credit card details. Yeah. So yeah, it, it makes sense. But yeah, the margins must be way for thin. Stephen, do you think that, uh, you know, for example, Bloom FM here in the UK, they do charge more as well. And do you think that... Uh, uh, it's just a question of volume, and if you know if they can get enough volume, then they can make up make up uh, for it uh, that way. Or is it a dangerous um, a move to uh, you know decide to lose thirty percent of your margin at this point? I think it's all about volume. Yeah, it's all about getting those users in the door first and getting folks signed on long term. Uh, and like Beats are in the business of acquiring users right now via whatever distribution deals they can do. And if you can get um, if you can make it easy for people to sign in, you know, just click buy on iTunes on their iPhone, one click, um, that's the way to do it, you know, for the moment. Yeah. But obviously, Spotify doing it a different way. Bloom FM, I was looking before I, I came online today, £14 uh, pounds for the top tier. Yeah. Bloom FM package here in the UK, uh, if you do it via iTunes, 10 quid if you do it via their website. So. Uh, it's brave from Beats, but they need to do it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, you know, from the non-factual side of things, which is more on the speculation front, uh, there was a report from Billboard uh, talking about the fact that uh, Beats music was off to a bit of a rocky start, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, in their 
in their report they say that you know the, the numbers are not where they're supposed to be given the, the amount of money they've spent on marketing so far including the uh, the Super Bowl advert that of course we talked about at length uh, when, he, when he came out uh, in February and uh, uh, you know there's a, a bit of concern around you know of course user adoption that is not coming from the AT&T side of things uh, and also the report was also quoting the fact that the company is already trying to find a new round of funding although Beats Music actually denied that uh, uh, later that day so Stephen do you think that it's uh, it's too early from a product perspective to call it uh, you know just three months in I think you know we need to give them a bit more of a runway to decide whether the service is working or not right yeah absolutely and uh, I'm sure when Beats have numbers to release you know they won't be uh, they'll be pretty quick about getting those numbers out there you know it's important that they that they that they're successful I think you know there's you know for for any stream you know streaming is still not mainstream people people are saying so and and the labels want beats to succeed. Uh, yeah. So yeah, you know, let's give them some time. Yeah, give some time to talk to to sort of uh, sort out the kinks, uh, and I'm sure that uh, uh, maybe when they do uh, tie up the the service with their headphones, that might be a big uh, a big boost to the to the service overall as well. And uh, yeah, I, I think they could. I, I'm I'm surprised that they haven't yet done that, but maybe it's still early in the in the cycle. You know, like yeah. I, I presume they're working on that on on some kind of distribution opportunities with the headphones. And uh, the AT and T deal, and then maybe they're figuring out international as well. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's the toughest part, isn't it? Uh, trying to figure out the licensing side of things for international is going to be a big headache for them as well. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's just a, a bit weird. Like at the moment, we're just going on rumors. So, Stuart, how do you feel about? There's a lot of articles these days that are, you know, a few writers that I, I trust wholeheartedly where you know you're talking about uh you know rumors or p people familiar with the subject but there you know there's a lot of speculation also around services so how do you handle that as a journalist so when it comes to like trying to decide whether that's a, a source worth uh, mentioning if it's if, if it's coming from a third party and, and you can't really confirm it yourself yeah it's hard because i mean leaks are great fun as journalists we yeah. have figures coming out um, if you've got them written down on paper, like we did, we did some stories in the past about um, Spotify, for example, where we, we had the figures from a label contact. Yeah. So we had them in black and white and we knew they were true, so we could go with it. And here, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of it is just ask the question of who who is leaking and why and yeah. what is their what is their kind of incentive and what they're doing. So here it's clearly labels saying we'd, we, we think we'd like to be doing something different. Yeah. So in a way that the billboard piece, it felt like a label saying we'd like to nudge them into a slightly different strategy of doing more free stuff, I think was the so yeah, so it's kind of it's often instructive uh, as much about the people leaking as it is about the service. Yeah. We're trying to gauge how labels see beats, how they'd like it to evolve, and seeing how the information flows on the front as well. Because yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I hadn't even realized because I haven't really tried beats extensively uh, being in the UK that there is a free component to the service that is not really advertised, but apparently they've boosted the number of tracks that is on that portion, which is an internet radio type play. Uh, so apparently, after the seven days of trial expire, you can still access this sort of uh, internet radio type service from beats which I didn't know anything about. So uh, I don't know if you guys had any more information on that. Um, no, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear about it myself. So yes, yeah, news yeah. to me. Mm. And they've been very big, haven't they? Like Ian Rogers, the boss has been very big on like, you pay for music, music has a value. We, we don't think we should give it to you free. Exactly. And we're not building that kind of business. And so that's the other thing is it's a dynamic here of, of he's been very clear about what how he sees Beats Music operating. Yeah. And it's going to be not ad funded and free. It's going to be a premium service. Yeah. And this article seemed to have rights holders saying we'd like it to have more free stuff, which would be a very big reversal to make, yeah. to change the kind of nature of this and make it more like Spotify and Deezer. And in a way, I kind of, uh, be, I'd li like Stephen was saying, I want to see it after a year and how it's done so we can understand if you can have success with a premium only streaming service yeah. with limited trial. Yeah. And it's interesting because then we've got, it's different to the others in that respect. Or well, Rhapsody, I think, is the most close we have, I suppose. So yeah, I, I, mean, I think, again, we were talking music about this, about how I think in America there's a big thing where you, you, you have a look at the first 100 days of anything and yeah. say, how's it gone? Which I think is like a JFK thing, isn't it? I think the first 100 days of the presidency. Yeah. But with a streaming service, that's far too short. You need like a year to see how it's caught on and what conversion rates are and so on. Yeah, exactly. So. And, I, and I mean, mo most people are still converting from... Uh, sort of the the free trial to the pay trial to the paid uh, service uh, that were on the a AT and T trials early on. So I think that that's really going to drive some of that too. If people start talking about it, or you know, they decide to sh to actually spend money on the service uh, on AT and T, and they might talk about talk about it with their friends, for example. So yeah, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens on, on that front too. You know, uh, you know. Uh, 
viral marketing is one of the most important things for these services and making sure the users are happy and that they advertise the service with their friends. So we're going to have to see what happens. And yeah. uh, uh, one of the most interesting stories that came out this week, uh, uh, as well as the uh, Beats uh, one, uh, is uh, Shazam. So Shazam uh, is uh, reportedly talking with Apple uh, about a tight integration of the service into iOS 8, uh, which is uh, could be pretty cool. You know. Uh, uh, Apple is trying to find ways to increase the number of downloads, uh, uh, you know, which are stalling or on the decline. And uh, uh, iTunes Radio has not proven to be a, a hugely successful uh, service for conversion from from the s streaming side to the to the uh, buying of tracks. And so Shazam could be that uh, stopgap that helps uh, uh, iOS uh, uh, increase the number of people that want to buy tracks uh, by recognizing them on the fly. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Stuart, you wrote a piece actually that uh, you know, where in the headlines you actually. Uh, wondered uh, uh, should uh, on Musical.ly should uh, uh, Apple buy Shazam, which is an interesting point. And so, you know, how, how do you see this partnership going? And uh, is Apple just uh, uh, holding back a little bit too much these days on acquisitions? I mean, we've seen Waze slip uh, through their hands, uh, or, you know, right when they were in in a desperate need for better data on maps. Uh, and uh, you know, it just seems like they should be a little bit bolder in their acquisition strategy. And, and they're they're still going, you know, for smaller companies and you know strategic acquisitions, but they haven't done a splashy acquisition in in quite some time. Yeah, and it's kind of their start. I think they always have the same official quote, which is like, we buy small companies from time to time, we're not going to tell you what we're doing with them. They yeah. stop asking us nosy questions. But I think, um, I think it would be a fascinating deal, whether it's a partnership or whether they were to buy Shazam. And there's no, it's literally me saying they, sh they maybe should buy it. There's no indication that they are considering that. Oh, no, that no, exactly, yeah, yeah. But um, I think Shazam, uh, we tend to look at it as the prism of music identification. You know, it's about Shazam in iOS so they can identify tunes and buy them. But actually what they're getting is something quite bigger if they do this, which is, the auto Shazam feature where Shazam sits there and listens to everything you listen to. So it knows what TV shows you've watched. It knows what music you listen to. Yeah. It's basically this record of your media habits. And if that was built into iOS, if your iPhone is sitting there doing that all the time for you and Apple then has that data. I mean, that's really valuable for Apple to have the data on what I've watched on TV, yeah. to have the data on what I've listened to, have data on what ads I've heard and seen on TV. So I think it's about that. It's about that data of understanding your media usage. Yeah. And music, music can benefit from that, and it maybe will be about making it easy to buy iTunes songs that you've heard in the real world. Yeah. But I think, it, I think it's more about getting... Because I think Apple traditionally... Apple knows what I've bought from iTunes over the last 10 years. Yeah. It doesn't know what I've listened to necessarily, especially as I've moved to streaming services. And this for Apple is a way of getting that data again. People who've maybe dropped out of its iTunes ecosystem a bit. I mean, I've bought so many apps. It knows lots about me on that side, but it doesn't know much about my music habits <laughs> yeah, or absolutely. my TV watching habits. Which is crazy, considering that music is where they started from. So uh, it's uh, they definitely missed a, a bit of a trick there uh, when it came yeah. to uh, data gathering. But then again, Apple have always been. We were talking last week about how Apple have always been very pro privacy, and they haven't really mined uh, uh, users as much as uh, uh, you know anywhere near as much as Google, for example. And so, uh, whether that strategy changes or not, that's going to be a question mark. And so, uh, Stephen, for you, uh, Shazam. Uh, an important company for the music ecosystem. We're seeing sort of conflicting reporting uh, reports on that front. Uh, you know, uh, do, do you believe Shazam is you know uh, going to be relevant in the next few years, and and uh, this Apple tie-up could be an important one for them? Um, yeah, I think it makes sense to bake it into iOS, like to do like Twitter and Facebook are baked into the product right now. Um, yeah. I guess Shazam's a big company now, so Apple probably. <laughs> You know, Apple have the money, but if you want to hire all of the hundreds of Shazam staff as well, so you know, Shazam is is huge on on both platforms. There's probably there's probably more users on Android than there is on iOS, so it could be a little bit awkward from some, if you look at it from that point of view. I'd love to yeah. see it baked into the product because sometimes, you know, like I know that they're working hard on TV, and I'm looking at some ads at times, and you know, like there's a call to action for a Shazam enabled ad, and by the time you get your phone out. Uh, and Shazam the track, you know, it takes yeah. <laughs> 10 to 15 seconds and ad spots are like 15 seconds to 30 seconds. So like I, I, I always uh, struggle sometimes to, to, to actually Shazam something when, when there is a call to action. So it does make sense to uh, to. Uh, bake it into the into I iPhone. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm excited also. You know, as uh, as we were saying about the the advertising potential for this, uh, uh, when you combine it with stuff like iBeacons uh, and uh, 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 and you know, you can get some pretty powerful. Uh, 
you know, recommendations and, and uh, pretty powerful sets of data as to where people are, what they're listening to, what activity they're engaged in, and uh, and uh, sort of tie that all together. Uh, you know, do you think that Apple is going to start leveraging this data? It, it feels like they kind of have to in order to start competing with some some of their uh, uh, competitors uh, on the marketplace right now. And uh, if they lag behind, they might just miss a boat uh, there. Yeah, so I think uh, context is a very important thing around all of the content. Yeah. So, you know, like we, like Apple know where you are, you know, they've got, they can tell where you are. But, you know, if they can tie that to a, 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 an episode of a X Factor or something, I think, I think uh, in the US, they, you know, X Factor and, and Shazam work together in the United States. I'd love to see more of that kind of happen in, in, the, uh, in, in Europe and in the yeah. UK. But, uh, yeah, so we're kind of, we're kind of moving into a... a a context driven world now you know so it'd be nice to be able to tie all of those things together and yeah in a, in hopefully a nice, the, uh, in a nice package <laughs> yes went, yes yes i went to a tv show recently a tv industry show and there was they were talking about google and the x factor in the us or google american idol i think it was yeah and google yeah. Like, if you search for an american idol contestant google would say hey do you want to vote in this week's american idol vote here and i think they said about half their votes were coming from google then and again, right. it was context. Like Google knows you're searching for someone who's a contestant in this series, so it says, "Well, why not vote?" I mean, Apple could do that on your phone. Yeah. You could say, "Right, I know you've just you're listening to this, or you're doing this, so why not?" Yeah, sort and also, if you, you. if you think about Shazam, you know, and you use the, the context thing again, you know, when you Shazam something, that, you know, in the latest version, there's lots of different drop-down options, and you know, you know, when you Shazam a track, by the way, you can listen on audio, sign up for an account, but there's also things like. Uh, the next show, you know, or yeah. so the context is like, why are people shazamming this track, you know, and like, here's, you know, so, so some of the other things that Shazam could do would be to put the context around that, like people are shazamming this now because, you know, so I think there's a bit more work to be done there, yeah. but I think we're getting, we're, I think in the next year or hopefully sooner, we'll see joining of those things together. Be, yeah. Be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, Shazam have already done a little bit of stuff, haven't they? I think at Christmas they have, they've got a new feature where if you're an artist, you can now reach out to people who've tagged you in the past from Shazam and you can send them a message saying, hi, I've got a new thing out. Yeah. I think they did with you. And, and you think about Apple then, think about, okay, well, everyone who's ever tagged Beyonce using Shazam, if Apple could then push them a thing saying she's got a thing, new thing on the, app, in the iTunes store, a new album of surprise, get yeah. it here. Or if it knows you've watched every episode of the last Game of Thrones series, Apple could push notify you saying, by the way, we've got a new episode in iTunes right now, click yeah. it to get it. Like, a lot of that, I'm, like, it, everyone's doing the same thing. I think Spotify is doing that. We know what you've listened to, so we think you'd like this. And by the yeah. way, here's a new album from that band you love. And Apple, Apple's ability to do that depends on it knowing what you've been doing and listening to and, and watching. So that's where Shazam would be a really good fit, I think, for a company, Absolutely. either with a partner or as a, as a buy. Absolutely. And, uh, and moving on from the digital side of things to the, to, to the physical side of things, it's a real pleasure to welcome Spencer Hickman, uh, the founder of uh, uh, Death Waltz Records and also the UK coordinator for Record Store Day. So hi, uh, Spencer, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? No problem. Yeah, all good. It's great to have you. And so uh, I want to talk about uh, Record Store Day. Of course, it happened on Saturday uh, and uh, it was a, a bigger deal than ever. Uh, it's, it's grown so much. So can you, can you give us a, a few of the latest numbers around Record Store Day this year? Uh, well, we haven't had any figures in yet, All but right. I mean, we had more stores than ever this year, so we had 240 stores to wow. participate. Um, and f from the stores that I've spoken to, they had much busier years through the till. Like this year was a lot busier through the till than it has been before. Yeah. And I mean, it's grown every year. So, I mean, uh, we're assuming that this year is, uh, you know, has been bigger than ever. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, I was at uh, rough, uh, rough Trade East uh, at 10.30, 11 a.m. And the queue was just insane. It was about 200 meters queue. And uh, I've, I've spoken to people that were there, uh, you know, at 7 a.m. And they still had to queue like an hour to get in. So <laughs> on that, in that sense, it was pretty successful but uh, uh, you know I want to talk about sort of the, the evolution of, of Record Store Day with you as well and sort of ask you a little bit about uh, what your thoughts are for, for uh, the evolution of, of the, the event because we've seen a few articles in the press that uh, you know are questioning uh, issues that are coming up to do with the, the, the production line of LPs and uh, independent labels having a harder time finding space at the other, other presses and, and all that kind of thing so, so what's your view on the day and how can it be managed so that everybody is kind of happy with the, with the, the way they are, uh, they can access facilities around the pressing of vinyl. 
the simple fact of the matter is when you've got a day that's worldwide and it's a worldwide celebration of record stores, you're never going to please everybody. Yeah. It's, it's an impossible task. What we do every year is we have a meeting in May where we sort of analyse the things that were good and the complaints that we've had. And, you know, I do take whenever a label says to me, we can't get our records pressed, then it's a worry. I mean, the problem you have is that there are no new manufacturing pressing being made. Yeah. So <laughs> that you just if GZ in Prague just found six machines and they hope to be able to get three of them working within the next six months. So as vinyl grows, it's going to be it becomes a problem. And yeah. somewhere like GZ at the moment is running at 24 hours a day. They're running at capacity as it is. I mean, all we can do is sort of look at the problems we've had this year and sort of try and give everyone better time frames and kind of just yep. we have to talk about it worldwide and figure out how you know what we can do about it but it, i mean it's it's difficult yeah absolutely uh, steven uh, did, did you, uh, what, what was the feedback you heard from record store day this year I'm a huge fan of Record Store Day, and uh, it's like one of the great days of the year for me in the music industry. It's like you meet so many people uh, in, in the stores, and it's kind of exciting. Yeah. Uh, I guess, you know, I, I've seen a lot of the, not a lot, but there were some like negative articles, but uh, that's because the Record Store Day has become so successful. Um, I, t well, I think it was Paul Weller was complaining about, you know, people were touting his, his record online same day, you know, because of the notion of exclusivity and short run discs. So that stuff's going to happen. I'd maybe I'd love to see, you know, I hate seeing people charging like crazy money for records that they bought the same day. It's disappointing, but uh, it's, it's, it's because it's successful. Um, yeah, yeah I, but I'm a massive fan and I think the guys have done a great job, but I'd love to see it. It's hard to thing to do, I guess. And I, the guys probably have this conversation all the time is like, make it record store day more than just one day or you know how do you make it into a week-long thing or yeah you know it's 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 easy, easier said than done absolutely yeah yeah uh, Stuart on your end what, what, what was the feedback that you read about uh, or that you that you heard yeah good I think it's ex just exciting to be, be really excited about music and physical music and meeting I mean it's yeah. funny because I, I, I write about digital music all the time and, and my, my focus focus on writing about stuff like community online and, and social networks and then writing about curation and they have a big theme of digital music curation and you think well community and creation is what the best record stores are about yeah. it's about people getting together and recording and i think if, i mean i live in bishop stortford in hertfordshire and we we used to have a record shop and, and now we don't we have basically sainsbury's smith's uh, and that's it but then we the, recently we've had a there's a pub a great blues pub and they've set up like a vinyl record store, essentially in the back of a pub. So you come and you get you get drinks and you buy records and you talk to people about it. That's awesome. And and that again, it's coming back this idea of, of community around buying music, not just not just a store where you pick up the latest chart CD. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Like I I I, I was actually this weekend kind of wandering out. It, it gives you it, it kind of reminds people, I think, of, of get down to the store, find out what's good, and then and then keep coming back after the day's over. So yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's a marvelous thing, I think. Yeah, exactly. And Spencer, uh, on your front, uh, uh, for, for uh, you know all the releases that were out, what what were the ones that excited you personally uh, that, that came out uh, over the six hundred plus? <laughs> um, <laughs> to the, the things that I bought, I picked up the Ghostbusters ten inch awesome. just because it glows in the dark. But <laughs> I'm gonna listen to it. it just looks amazing. Nice. I got the Life Life Without Buildings record. Um, I got the Joy Division record. Adam and the Ants reissue. Very cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Supersonic Oasis done a reissue of Supersonic as well. I think that That's was one of the cool. biggest, biggest and fastest sellers as well. Mm, yeah. Stores. So. Right. Absolutely, that's cool. And uh, that's very cool. I mean, I, I look forward to seeing what happens uh, next year with it as well. And uh, and uh, you know, I, I think you know, as as any big event, uh, uh, there are always going to be kinks as the event scales and you know it's impossible to make an event scale to this size without there being some issues that come along the way but uh, uh, you know the it's also a question of you know I've, I've read a lot of a, a few pieces about from people that buy records regularly and they go to the record store every week and uh, you know a few of them maybe were disappointed with the fact that they had to queue and have to do a number of things but at the same time it's also it's not really about them record store day it's also about people that wouldn't normally go to a record uh, record shop and that you know rediscover the pleasure of doing that uh, through record store day which is a, which is a pretty big deal because the more people we get uh, to go and buy uh, 
uh, music, the better it is for, for the whole ecosystem. So that's why, you know, I wanted to talk about this week and uh, definitely uh, keep up the good work and uh, look forward to uh, chatting to you next year as well and see and see how it all goes. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the Wu-Tang uh, <laughs> Clan's uh, uh, fans Kickstarter, which is kind of a weird story because uh, uh, the fans of the Wu-Tang Clan decided to uh, start a Kickstarter to try and raise uh, five million pound uh, dollars uh, in order to buy the band's uh, latest record. So the latest record the Wu-Tang uh, Clan is releasing is called uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Shaolin, and it's a one-off uh, uh, copy which is not going to be released digitally it's encased in a silver and nickel box uh, crafted by british moroccan artist uh, uh, yahya i'm sure that i pronounced it wrong and uh, you know uh, the forbes goes on to say you know it, it will probably sell for uh, a lot of money uh, so the fans decided to start this kickstarter to uh, raise the money necessary to uh, get the release in the hands of fans and actually distribute it. Uh, I mean, the record will tour, apparently it will tour uh, festivals and, and uh, art galleries and centers, and people are going to be able to listen to it for a fee, which is kind of weird. Uh, you know, it's uh, talk about trying to reintroduce custody music. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, uh, the fans wanted to buy it. You know, of course, the campaign is not doing very well because there's no... Uh, you know, you don't get anything out of it other than the chance of listening to the record, which uh, for a lot of fans is probably not enough to shell enough money to get to the five million dollar mark but uh, you know for you guys uh, you know w what do you think about the campaign and uh, and uh, the fact that this uh, release got so much press in the last in the last uh, week or so Stephen? Uh, I, I think the whole thing sounds crazy to me you know i'm not I, you know i think it was all it, i hope it's all it's all a joke you know <laughs> uh, and like uh, the, the whole kickstarter thing I, I i'm not a big fan of kickstarter campaigns you know i've i've be, i've, I've, I've bought into a lot of them in music and I, I've been disappointed a few times by right. some of the Kickstarter campaigns. I think they're they're not all great in my opinion. Um, yeah, I was looking at the, the money raised by the guys that tried to, you know, fair play to them to try and initiate <laughs> something, but I think they've got a couple of hundred dollars raised out of the five million target. Uh, yeah. So they, they've got a way to go. Um, it makes no sense to me, this five million dollar record thing, you know. It's, yeah. It's actually, I find it quite annoying. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I just hope... I hope it's it's all a hoax. I mean, that both, good PR, though. <laughs> yeah, it's good PR. Both things are weird. I mean, both the the record itself, which is supposed to be like a one-off piece that is not going to be distributed digitally to anybody else, so that you can only listen to it in person uh, as a sort of an art piece. And also, the Kickstarter is weird. So both stories are kind of like a, a, a oddballs, really. Uh, Stuart, do you think that uh, you know we're going to see more artists trying to really? Uh, trying really, really hard to reintroduce a scarcity into the music industry by doing something like this, which is pretty extreme, really. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of like the idea of, of, of transient music. It's almost like the Snapchat of music. You right. hear it once and then you can't do it. And they're probably going to take your phone off you when you go in to listen to it. You can't, no recording devices allowed, which yeah. it, to think that someone won't get in somehow with a recording device and stick it on BitTorrent on the next day is, is, is ambitious, I think. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's weird because it, uh, the thing it reminded me of, in a weird way, which is very different, is the Jay Z Samsung campaign, oh, where right. a brand a brand paid loads of money for the album to then give it to people. So it was like it was it was a, a corporate person paying yeah. for the music, but then distributing it for free and make opening out to people. So that seems like it's got more more go in it than the whole we'll do one thing and one rich person can buy it and. I mean, the other thing is, it's not peak Wu Tang Clan, is it? I mean, no. God, God, <laughs> no. God, God, God bless them. I mean, you know, they've been they've been pioneers and, and, and rightfully kind of acclaimed. Yeah. But it's not Wu Tang Clan at their their creative peak years ago. And and so you don't know what you're getting. You know, you might go in and it might be like the off cuts of like we can't be asked <laughs> anymore. Here's a you just don't know. So I mean, I love the idea of it as an event. I love the fact they're kind of going around and playing at museums and it's kind of making you think about music as art and all those sort of things. So I, I like that aspect of it, but I wish at the end it wasn't just one person gets it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I hopefully, it... hopefully it will be just all, 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 all a bit of a PR story and then in the end it will get released digitally. Yeah, I mean, do you remember that? The, the XX did that thing last year where they, they leaked the, the, the stream of their album to one fan and yeah. then watched it spread. And that whole idea of giving it to one person and letting it spread is, is really exciting. And I, yeah. I kind of wish that had been the thing here. Like someone gets to keep this beautiful jewel box with the album, the artifact. Yeah. But then maybe that person flicks the switch to release it digitally to everyone else. Yeah. Like, that, that would be more exciting i think and the whole thing also like it goes back to what nine inch nails did uh, f a fair few years ago now where they uh purposefully lost uh, a few uh, usb keys in a bathroom of one of their venues mm. and then 
uh, those uh, sticks had a few tracks uh, leaked from their latest record, and then they started making the rounds, uh, you know, amongst the fans, and it became a whole viral thing. In a sort of, it was like an, an interactive campaign. Actually, it was kind of a dystopian future, and it, it had a whole plot to it. So if you found the stick, you had to sort of start this whole movement. So definitely something that there's something there, and, and not many artists have managed to take advantage of it, uh, as well as uh, Nine Inch Nails have uh, since that release. But uh, yeah, to just distribute it like this is kind of it's kind of weird. But uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, <laughs> it's, kind of a fun it's a fun time for hip-hop, though, because you had Jay-Z doing the Samson thing, you had De La Soul giving their entire back catalog with BitTorrent, yeah. you have, um, I can't remember what the name is now, but BitTorrent are doing some mixtapey stuff with, with a bunch of guys from Detroit, I think. Yeah. Like, like, obviously, that, like, actually, I've been writing about this stuff for 10 years, and consistently it's been the hip-hop um, guys in the States yeah. who got, they had new media managers first, digital guys first, they were... They were constantly the first to sort of explore new ideas, and sometimes they are a bit crazy. Like this, sometimes they're like, from like we have a joke of music guy. Snoop Dogg is always first onto everything new. He's, he was first to sell virtual items. He was first yeah. on turn to you know, like there's just this smart group of people operating in the U.S. around 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 rappers at the moment who are saying we're going to try new ways of distribution. So in that sense, it's quite an exciting. So I think the Wu Tang kind of fits into that, even if it's a bit barking. In certain aspects yeah absolutely and it's kind of funny that uh the whole mixtape phenomenon as well because uh, i i don't i'm not really a massive fan of hip-hop but i have downloaded like some of the uh best mixtapes from last year for example and there was some amazing stuff there that is has never been released commercially and it's not on spotify it's not on any streaming service so also because of probably uh, sample clearance issues and all sorts of stuff around that but uh it's kind of incredible that such a creative space is uh, is so underground still but it's so big and it's it's just a uh, uh, one of the sort of un unseen, uh, 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 you know, elephants of of the music industry. The fact that there's this whole un un underbelly of uh, of releases that are never seeing the light of day when it comes to to streaming services. Whilst you can, you're seeing millions of crappy cover versions or uh, crappy karaoke versions flooding them <laughs> at the same time. So it'd be nice if we could find ways to monetize those effectively and and clear the samples a little bit more uh, easily. But you know, uh, that's the industry we're in. And uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the uh, Pandora story. I wanted to uh, sort of uh, pick up from what we, what we talked about last week with Deborah Newman uh, from New York, and uh, uh, there was a development actually uh, late last week as the major labels, together with Abco and the RIAA, have filed a suit in the U.S. against Pandora on the issue of pre-1972 recording. So the Copyright Act protects the master recordings post-1972 on a federal level, but not the pre-1972 ones. So it's it's a very uh, it's a slightly complicated issue, but uh, essentially what happens is that uh, a service like Pandora. So so far has only paid sound exchange which is the you know the performing uh, rights society that they're collecting the, is collecting the revenues for the performance of those master recordings for post 1972 recordings uh, and all the ones before that are not receiving a penny right now on the master front and so of course uh, the labels are uh, up in arms about it and they believe that uh, even though they're not protected on a federal level they should be protected on a state law level and are uh, you know uh, filing a suit in order to approve just that and uh, apparently there's tens of millions of dollars on the table of royalties each year that are not paid out uh, and uh, you know there's a there's a big debate right now going on 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 various sites uh, as to whether this is another case of the labels trying to crush uh, Pandora, whether it's uh, another case of, you know, the law just being completely unreasonable in the way that it's structured. And so it being just kind of weird that people before a certain date in 1972 can get paid and the ones before can't. And so, you know, I, I, it's just a, a big headache right now when it comes to Internet radio services in, in the US. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, from your end, you know, from a, a Shuffler fan perspective, uh, how do you feel about all this? And uh, uh, do you think that, the, you know, the labels should cut Pandora some slack at this point? It's a tough one. Um, you know, like Pandora, they, they seem to be brilliant at <laughs> upsetting people in the music industry. You know, I was uh, reading a story yesterday, I think it was Buddy Holly's Widow, Right. And like she's extremely upset. She's been upset saying that they're not getting remunerated because it's pre seventy two. And um, uh, I was listening to Stuart uh, this morning, and they were like, all the Beatles stuff is pre seventy two, and right. you know it's it's a real mess. It's a real mess. Um, you know, Pandora is is hugely popular. You know, they've got massive amounts of users, and it's a great service. But you know the the labels just are not happy with you know with the money that they're getting back and I don't know how much slack they can cut them because because artists need to get compensated fairly and yeah. and you know 
Pandora are upsetting so many people. You know, <laughs> I, I, I wish there was a... There's no easy answer. It's a bit of a nightmare, but... It is a bit of a nightmare, you know, yeah. It's, 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 it's a bit sad. It's a kind of a legislative nightmare that is a nightmare both for the labels and for Pandora because it's so expensive also on the legal front to, f to fight and find a middle ground on this. So, uh, Stuart, from a Pandora perspective, uh, do you think that uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, p people are going to be too hard on Pandora right now? Or is it just uh, the nature of uh, this hodgepodge of legislations that needs to be sorted out at some point or another? And so, so kind of a confrontation in court is uh, at this point inevitable. Yeah, well, I mean, they have got the full house now, haven't they? They've got publishers sort of bitching at them, they've got labels bitching at them, they've got artists and songwriters unhappy. And I think <laughs> it's a weird one. On one hand, this, this taps into this really unpleasant sort of backstory in the music industry, which is of the of music companies saying tech companies have built businesses based on our, our material and they're not yeah. compensating us enough. And, and with Pandora, they can't, they can't take licenses away from them because it's a blanket license. So they can't, they can't kind of, they can't exert the kind of pressure they would normally do. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think in this case, it's not Pandora is bad. It's is the copyright laws yeah. right and working? You know, Pandora is doing nothing wrong by not paying these royalties because the law seemingly says it doesn't have to. And yeah. this court case, I mean, this and Sirius XM as well. This is satellite radio case. So they were sued first, I think, by the labels, and that case is going through. So the, the cases will prove well. You do have to pay royalties, and Ringo Starr can have another another jumbo liner. Um, <laughs> but it, but it is. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things where it is. Um, it is. I mean, like Buddy Holly's Willow widow is, is out speaking this weekend, saying, you know, there was a bunch of musicians and their dependents and their families who made brilliant music before those years and aren't sitting there now with kind of mounds of money. Yeah. So there is a there is quite an emotional as aspect to this that people. On the other hand, this is slightly. Uh, this is, I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, but. If you were to talk to artists pre nineteen seventy two about who they've been exploited by, it's not just by digital services now. Oh. <laughs> you know, there were some dodgy label deals in those days and some yeah. deals. You know, the, the music industry has a history of, of exploiting people. So I think, so I think for labels to kind of say those poor artists in those days they're not getting the money they deserve, it's a little bit. It leaves them open, I think, to people saying, "Hang on a minute, you know, are you paying them fairly for stuff?" That's being used? Yeah. So. It's a it's a can of worms inside a nest of hornets. This stuff. Absolutely, but, absolutely. But I think it, 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 it should it should come down to not is Pandora bad or wrong. It should come down to is the copyright laws fair, and if not, how do they need to be? And, and then and then people at Pandora will will then they'll they'll know where they stand. Yeah. Um, I think that's what the other thing is Pandora does. Pandora do lobby. I think to the lobbying to bring down their world commitments you know i think they're probably lobbying to keep this loophole in you know so it's not just i think there is there's a lot of bad blood on both sides from a, from a variety of things and that so that's where when this comes out yeah. it becomes pandora against the music companies and it's it's very bad tempered and, and uh, although i understand it i'm disappointed because pandora is one of the most successful things we have in terms of building scale and getting yeah. people to kind of listen and pay so i wish there was i wish there was less less rancor in it yeah i wish you know it, it is like a business uh, story really and you know there's a lot of uh, emotion uh, you know emotions that are put into these stories when it comes to like you know is the music industry trying to crush pandora or is pandora stealing money from the music industry and at the end of the day it's just a question of business and money and uh, you know the, the emotions uh, that are running high of course because it, it involves artists are, are kind of hard to control and i mean i guess one of the interesting issues around this is because sound exchange actually pays artists directly is uh, a, a percentage of the money they get uh, goes directly to the artist instead of going via the record label so i guess that's maybe where it becomes uh, much more emo emotional for the artist because of course they've been ripped off on, on their contracts uh, pre-1972 anyway because uh, i doubt they're getting a lot of royalties through those uh, uh, and you know the idea of being able to claim uh, x amount from sound exchange uh, that goes directly to them or to their relatives then that's a pretty uh, you know, interesting uh, uh, new form of income for them that uh, they haven't seen before. So uh, I think on that front, it's definitely something that artists uh, pre-1972 would be, would be uh, interested in getting. Uh, of course, the labels want to get uh, th their their own share, and that's why they they file the lawsuit. So we'll see we'll see how that shakes out. And uh, I want to talk about uh, live. So um, we've seen an interesting development at Rock in Rio today. Rock in Rio US announced uh, a couple of uh, uh, new. Uh, 
uh, details on what's going to happen in uh, Las Vegas next May in 2015. Uh, the festival has a new venue that is going to get built uh, right on the Strip, which sounds amazing, which is going to hold up to 80,000 people. And it will be, will be paid for by M MGM, Cirque du Soleil and uh, Eucapia. The three companies uh, will uh, own the venue and presumably use it for a variety of other shows throughout the year. But Rock in Rio is booked in there for 2015, 2017 and 2019. Uh, Rock in Rio is set to create a very premium festival experience with uh, amusement parks on site, a flying DJ booth, and uh, actually real toilets, which is amazing for a, for a music festival. And uh, there's no word on a lineup or pricing yet, uh, and tickets go on sale in January 2015. Uh, the festival is also doing a big push on American media, of course, to try and get a bit more recognition, because, uh, you know, Rock in Rio is a well-known name for music fans, uh, especially if you're looking up stuff on YouTube, you know, it will come up with some amazing performances through the years, but... Uh, on a mainstream level, it may not be uh, as well known a festival, so definitely some work to be done on there. And uh, through the SFX Entertainment Partnership, we can expect to see a lot of uh, uh, um, electronic music as well uh, being part of the festival and being incorporated as well as the usual rock and pop mix uh, that uh, Rock and Rio is well known for. So, uh, uh, Stephen, are you excited about this new festival? And uh, uh, would you would you make the trip and try and experience a, a, a big time music festival in in Vegas? <laughs> I'd much prefer to go to Rio, Rock in Rio, you know, it's, it's, you know, the concept of Rock in Rio in Vegas to me, not so appealing, but it's, it makes, you know, th these guys, they, 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 they've probably done the numbers, you know, the, someone like MGM and Cirque du Soleil, they've got it all worked out. They know the occupancy rates, they know, they have it all figured out and they know who, <laughs> they probably know who they're putting, you know, with the SFX partnership, who they're going to have headline next year. They've taught all this out there. These guys are forensic you know <laughs> but um They're all yeah a, a, a lot of people are like vegas but is a south bio are doing a kind of a satellite event in vegas as well yeah. um you know it's just it seems like an excuse to fill hotel rooms in vegas uh you know which you know fair play to the guys in last in the nevada state gambling commission or whoever it is <laughs> lobbying to get uh, rock and rio in there um, yeah, yeah. No, no doubt it will be a success, but not for me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Stuart, for for you, do you see any? You know, could this be an interesting intersection of uh, a variety of different entertainment forms, and and maybe we can see something new come up here uh, rather than the the usual music festival. Maybe, but flying DJ booth. What have we become? What have we become? <laughs> <laughs> it's, ba it's basically Tommy Lee and his flying drum kit all over again for the EDM engine. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I mean Vegas because Vegas Vegas already has this big line going in, in, in dance music stuff, hasn't it? They have big big yeah. raves there, and it's, it's become a big part of the thing. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. I saw a presentation. Was it a medium? The guy from yeah. Rock in Rio did a presentation, an interview, talking about how they're, they're expanding and, and going everywhere. And it is they're obviously an interesting organisation. They're they're thinking hard about where to go and why. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would. I think I agree with Stephen. I'd rather go to Rio. I'd rather go to Rio and see the proper carnival than, yeah. than go to Rock in Rio because I think it's 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 this big rock bands playing a big big gig. It's an amazing thing. But I, I kind of I'd more rather go to Rio and see see the kind of the Brazilian thing. It doesn't happen over here. Yeah. But no, I mean, I mean, all, the only thing that, the only thing that appeals to me uh, is that you can go to a festival and actually. Uh, go back to your very nice uh, hotel room in Vegas after <laughs> after that, <laughs> and then instead gamble to, it all away instead of having to go into a tent, which is definitely it, appealing. But uh... you know, I, I'm wondering, will it damage the brand? You know, is it, is there any chance that you know, like some of these partnerships or some of these you know guys that have done things great forever? You know, when you change, you know, sometimes it's, it's not rock and Rio, and it's some you know, sometimes it's successful. You know, like the Tour de France, you know, to take sports and cycling. You know, they've done Tour de France all around. Europe, you know, in, in Ireland and London and in yeah. different cities, so it makes it's, it's worked for those guys. But um, you know, so, you know, I, I was at a conference, you know, not a conference. I was at a talk yesterday, and one of the guys from the founder of Fabric Nightclub, you know, he's been, he was talking about, you know, once you start selling out or doing some of these things, you're not what you what you were at the beginning, and you've right. lost a lot of authenticity and. Um, you know, it's a it's a whole different mindset. It's not what you set out to be. And you know, he the, the guys at Fabric, you know, just you know, one of the great clubs. You know, the last twenty years probably. And you know, they've turned down so many of these uh, opportunities to do things all around the world. And. Uh, he said he sleeps easy at night because of that. You know. Yeah, it's there's two different models, right? You know, Ministry of Sound model. Which is you know taking it all over, all over the world and yeah, yeah and uh, working like that and and the 
uh, and the other side of things where you try and keep it contained and keep it uh, uh, true to the sort of the original nature of the project but uh, uh, both valid both with their own merits and uh, but yeah I, I mean I, I'm excited to see what's gonna happen with it it's definitely gonna be a something they're gonna experiment with because uh, uh, they don't have that much brand presence in the in the US yet and so definitely they're gonna have to try some interesting stuff in the run-up to it so I'll keep an eye on it and see and see we could do a uh, Freddie Mercury hologram performance God, you know no, 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 no. <laughs> from uh, it was 82 that had Queen done Rock and Rio yeah that's an amazing yeah. performance I love that's it in my head because Rock and Rio I, I, I think did Guns N' Roses play there once as well to an enormous yeah. crowd like, it, that's in my head is Rock and Rio it's like stupidly enormous crowds yeah what do yeah. your bands play and it'd be interesting to see how that goes but, but I mean I think it, it's one of those things where where now more so than ever before festival brands are global, global things like Glastonbury is known around the world it attracts people from everywhere yeah. um, we know about I mean in Europe we, we kind of people sit down and go I might go to Croatia for a festival this year I might go to Primavera in Barcelona like I, I, I mean, and maybe I'll go to Vegas and see, see them. so I think these, these brands are becoming global and they are all thinking well how can we what can we do and where can we do it and how can we draw people in so yeah, but like like Steven says, like the fact that Rock in Rio is a brand, it sounds like it maybe won't describe this new event quite so aptly. Maybe they could spin off a new brand and create something new. You know, yeah. it'd be interesting to see how it goes. Like Rock in Rio with the flying DJ boot sounds like an intrinsically strange thing, but, <laughs> yeah. but you know, good luck to them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's uh, SFX is definitely pushing hard for that, I'm sure. And uh, oh. uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, you know, we're gonna have to close uh, fairly soon, but I uh, just wanted to cover a couple of uh, quick things. Uh, so first of all, Samsung has revealed that uh, the Milk Music app has been downloaded 380,000 times since its launch in the US. So that's a significant number, although it's uh, not a scratch yet on Pandora's numbers or even Songza's numbers, really. And the company has accidentally revealed its plans to actually start charging for the Milk Music app, which is a, a departure from the fact that it, you know, it was supposed to be completely free for everybody and uh, advertising free as well for Samsung uh, uh, owners, Samsung device owners. Uh, and now they're going to charge somewhere in the region of three ninety nine per month, uh, which is a uh, uh, you know it's Pandora's old price point. Pandora is uh, jacking up the prices as of next month to four ninety nine, I believe. Uh, and uh, you know. We talked about Milk last week on the show in the context of Samsung's partnership with Deezer in Europe. Uh, but uh, you know, what do you guys make of the number and, and the potential number of users that might actually take up the the uh, you know the premium option on what's really like it's actually just a branding exercise on, on Samsung's part. I mean, let's not be kidding around here. We're not talking about a real service because it's all based on Slacker uh, Slacker Radio. It's actually you know very much a branding exercise. Uh, Stuart, so what are your thoughts on that? I'm kind of intrigued by Samsung because I mean, in terms of selling phones. Uh, and, and to less than tablets, they're, they're really successful. They're, they're selling lots, lots more than Apple and everyone else. Like biggest, but in terms of music, it's been a bit... First, first they bought M-Spot, that cloud company, and they made their own Samsung Music Hub, which didn't do that yeah. well. Now they've got a deal with Deezer in Europe to do bundling stuff. They're doing this milk thing themselves in the States. They seem to be very much... They, they're going back out to sort of... Whereas, whereas Apple's when we do everything ourselves, yeah. Samsung's be going back out to saying, we'll get partners like Deezer in and we'll get Slacker Radio in. And So I'm... Fascinating to see why they then then they haven't really had success with the music strategy so far. Yeah, um, I mean, milk is it seems to tie into that thing people were saying of actually most people want music to play to them. They don't want to go and choose stuff. They want to have radio like things. So it makes sense to have that within devices. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, we haven't because it's not over here yet. We haven't been able to play with it. I mean, I'm, I'm like Beats. You know, we're waiting for it to kind of launch in the UK so we can have a good old explore and see how it compares exactly and also you would have to have a samsung phone to be able to, to try it out so that's uh, that's another problem mm. <laughs> right there but yeah it's kind of weird that you know an app that you can only access through certain phones anyway that's a branding exercise for the brand you then start charging for or try to convert people to a premium tier i don't know uh, uh steven do you think that uh, uh samsung can challenge uh, uh, pandora's domain in this and and why would they want to do that would it, why don't they just keep it free and take the hit on the on on, on the money i mean it's not going to be that much anyway yeah, I agree with you, Andre. I don't think they can challenge. I think, you know, they can get a lot of people to download the app because, you know, they can push that app to the front of or bundle it in with lots of phones. So distribution and downloads isn't a problem. Like, I'm not surprised by the 380,000. Like, it's going to be, you know, a tiny amount that those people will pay. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure why they're doing it. You know, it just, it's not so interesting to me, you know. Um uh, you know, and I, you know, I think they're doing some smarter partnerships in Europe. Like the stuff with Deezer yeah. is is pretty good. You know, Deezer is a rock solid service. It's, it works really well. Um, you know, and they can get a lot of people to download Deezer here in Europe. Um, you know, that it makes no sense to me to 
Trump, you know, they're not even going to make a lot of money, are they? If you know, if, yeah. if say ten percent of that, ten percent of three hundred eighty thousand people download it at the, at the very maximum, it's not, it's not a huge amount of money when you exactly. factor everything into it. And I mean, that's also because not so compares. Oh, sorry. No, what it it uh, milk compares to what Nokia has done with mix radio. Interesting. Like you, you get the phone, it's free, and you get this thing playing you radio channels, and then you can subscribe for a more premium experience. Um, and Nokia's never given out any figures for Mix Radio. We're not sure what Microsoft are going to do with it once they buy Nokia because they have their own thing. But it's interesting to see Samsung basically following Nokia's template in yeah. a way there. I mean, um, I guess the one thing I just thought right now is that Slacker is not just a radio service. So Slacker's got three or four different tiers. And you can go all the way from you know, a free uh, uh, radio service all the way to an actual uh, premium on-demand streaming service, which is their $9.99 a month offering. Uh, which not that many people know about, but Slacker do have that option. You can actually subscribe as a fully fledged streaming service. So whether some of the premium stuff that Samsung plans to offer is going to integrate some of those parts of Slacker as well and offer a more sort of on-demand experience, we don't know. But that could be interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be interesting. That's probably what they're going to do, actually. Yeah, there might be that because I mean it would make sense considering the visa partnership here in Europe. Uh, but yeah, that could be that could be interesting. But again, you know. That would have to be a very, it would be confusing to the consumer because they started with the milk service as being an internal radio service and it, then if they converted it into a premium on-demand service then that would make it a very difficult thing to explain. So yeah, lots of question marks on that. And uh, a couple of uh, things to finish with uh, uh, that I just mentioned without commenting on because we haven't got time, but uh, uh, Sony Music has uh, struck a partnership with the Z Music company in India to license the radio, digital and physical rights of uh, uh, the music of seven high-profile Bollywood movies, which should push it to becoming the leader in the Bollywood market in India, 35% uh, according to Business Standard. And uh, the music startup Beat Robo uh, got a 1.1 million fundraise uh, uh, from a, a chain, actually, from a, a Japanese uh, a store chain called Lawson. Uh, and uh, this is going to go towards uh, developing the Plug Air device, uh, which aims to be the mixtape of the future. So it's a little device that plugs into the headphone jack of uh, a, a device, uh, of, a, of a phone, and uh, it uh, acts as a key for instantly downloading music and playlists. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting play here. Uh, I'm not sure how it's gonna uh, pan out, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, you guys uh, think that there is a you know the Japanese market is weird because uh, they still they're still trying to manage this transition to to digital from physical. Uh, do you think that a little uh, you know hardware device that mimics uh, the function of uh, a CD to just download tracks uh, can uh, gain traction somewhere that you know where where the, the industry is in such a weird flux? Only in Japan. <laughs> in Japan, right? <laughs> might might be brilliant in Japan. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get the guys on 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 a call and see and see what they're what they're working on. But uh, it's definitely it doesn't sound like something that would ever work here in the UK or in the US. So uh, it's a very uh, niche product. But you know, the Lawson has got ten thousand outlets in Japan. Wow. So if they manage to get it out there, then uh, it could uh, uh, you know become a bridge between the physical and digital uh, uh, spaces uh, in the Japanese music industry. So it's definitely one to keep an eye on. And uh, 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 finally, I just wanted to ask you what you guys are up to, if you want to plug anything. Uh, Stuart, anything you want to plug, uh, either an article you've just finished uh, or something that uh, you're working on, An anything at all. Oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, I should be winning. Well, actually, at Music Ally, so we're just, we've just we got a post-Easter treat um, awesome. we're doing at the moment. Um, where we're basically we're trying to give people two months free trial to our newsletter and our reports because we realise that people who get music LA love it and quite a few people out there still think of us as that blog that writes about digital music and they don't realise we have this pay service. So, so yeah, so if anyone goes to musicali.com, um, there's banners to get this two month free trial with no strings. You don't put credit card details in, we're not going to hassle you at the end. It's just like two months of it. If you like it at the end, then you can decide if you want to subscribe. So yeah, come to, come to the site and, and have a look. And I thoroughly recommend that as well. And uh, uh, Stephen, on your front, what's going on on Shuffler? Anything you want to uh, loop us in with? Um, yeah, good timing today. We uh, A couple of months ago, we launched our, an app called Pause in the iTunes App Store. Yeah. Initially, it was like, so the first edition we put out in February. Been pretty well received. Got a lot of love from uh, lots of folks. Um, we just launched the second edition of Pause, so it's a, we're oh, kind wow, of doubling. Awesome. We're, nice. Yeah, so so it's I'm it's going to be right available to, uh, from the iTunes App Store now available for iPhone. So we're kind of doubling down. You know, Shuffler is is known for curation and 
the, this version is uh, it's a quarterly curated magazine highlighting the best of the music web. Um, we've got some great articles in there, great websites, great editorial, tastemakers, and uh, it's free. Check it out on iPhone and iPad. Um, That's awesome. Please. That's awesome. And so this, I, I uh, tell you what, I, I, to, to, I'll plug your product too because I, I love the idea, this idea. That there's so much music whizzing past the noses and so many blogger posts and that. I love the idea of something that says, you know what, we're going to do a quarterly thing and just round up the best stuff and you can sit and read it in one, in one go. But it's a really nice idea because I think we're all being overloaded with stuff constantly all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So I like that. He, yeah. he described it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my, marketing, my, my fees for being in marketing uh, consultant so are low. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of uh, magazines that I follow. Like, uh, they're free, I think. Uh, there's Ox. Uh, there's also like the CBC Music uh, Canada is quite a good. Uh, it's quite a good resource for 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 music too. But uh, a pause on a quarterly basis is is a must have uh, for anybody that listens to the show. So go and get it right now if you haven't. Thanks, guys. Already. And uh, well, guys, it was a real pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, thanks so much for coming on uh, once again. And uh, uh, thanks so much for listening as well. Uh, you can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com. I also do weekly interviews with the startups and interesting digital music projects uh, so you can check those out if you go to digitalmusictrends.com and follow through the links uh, to the one-to-one -one show and uh, all the interviews are there there's about 56 shows to date and uh, uh, if you want to get in touch uh, again uh, tweet us on at digimusictrends or email contact at digitalmusictrends.com have a fantastic week and until uh, next time